Hi, I'm Susan. Welcome to my home and studio at Wendy Acre Cottage. It's a hundred year old craftsman cottage where I love to paint and garden and entertain and care for all my wonderful fur babies, both those that are adopted and all the little fosters. It's also my home base for many fun adventures of the art, history, and gardening kind. Hello, creative spirits, and welcome back. This week I filmed a painting foundations class for Spring Hill Parks and Rec as part of their Brilliant Strokes series. This is episode one of Learn to Paint in Five Steps with special emphasis on the underpainting. Today's class is simply using the burnt sienna underpainting that we've used in so many other paintings in the past, but it is step one and we will get a little more difficult as we go along. So let's get started. Hey, welcome back. This is Susan and we're going to work on our Brilliant Strokes program, class number one, and it's painting with acrylic paints. You should have your packet with you already or your supplies list where you've gotten all of your supplies. So let's get started. We're going to learn to paint in five steps and although this doesn't count as a step it's very important to tell you this part we have to take the plastic off of the canvas i've been teaching for 10 years now and if i don't tell my students to do that some of them will try to paint on the plastic and that just does not work so i'm going to use just a palette knife to open it up And believe it or not, this is the hardest part of the class. So if you can get that plastic off, you are good to go. I'm using an easel just so you can see better today, but if you wanna just paint flat on the table, that's fine too. I usually go and buy just a dollar of plastic tablecloth to put down just to make sure we don't mess anything up. And we're gonna get started with step number one. And that is to paint our underpainting. Now I'm gonna use a palette to put my paint on, and that can either be a styrofoam plate, not paper, because that will absorb the paint, or a styrofoam egg carton. Again, not the cardboard, because that will absorb the paint. I even know artists that use magazines as their palettes. So you don't have to go buy a fancy palette at all. You do want to have some paper towels, a washer cup with water, you want to have your paint and you want to have your paintbrush. Now, let's see here. Go ahead and put out all of your paint. You want about a, I would say a nickel's worth, you know, about the size of a nickel, of your three primaries, red, yellow, and blue, plus black and white. And because we're painting a brilliant orange, I went ahead and put out the convenience color of orange. So you want that on your palette as well. And then I also, as a convenience, put out burnt sienna. Our underpainting is going to be in burnt sienna, but this is the easiest color to mix if you don't have any. It's just a little red, a little yellow, and a little blue, but not in equal portions. You want to have a little less blue than the red and yellow. We want it to be a warm neutral that we're doing our underpainting in. So when we do an underpainting, we're really just trying to tone our canvas. Do you see how bright and brilliant that is? When we do the underpainting, we want it to be a neutral um, underpainting. So we're going to use a lot of water to keep it really thin. Dip your brush in that burnt sienna, and then you want to paint your entire canvas in a thin, watery, burnt sienna wash. There's no wrong way to do this. The thinner that paint is, the quicker it's going to dry. If you use too much wa water and it gets really runny, you can just grab a paper towel and smear that around. This canvas is a nine by 12, which is pretty small. It doesn't take very long at all. And it's a canvas panel. And there we go. That's step number one. 
So we put out our colors, three primaries, red, yellow, and blue, plus black and white, and the convenience colors of orange and burnt sienna. We've got our underpainting, which is step number one. So we're gonna to move to step number two, and that is to block in our basic shapes. Now everyone should have a reference photo of an orange in direct light with a cast shadow. I find it easier to take my reference and fold it in half, one direction, open it up, fold it in half the other direction, and now with the creases, you've got four quadrants of your reference photo. I'm gonna take a little burnt sienna and put a tick mark in the middle of my canvas at the top, at the bottom, at the side, and at the other side. In my mind's eye, I can connect those tick marks into lines. And now I'm gonna transfer the basic shape from my reference photo onto my canvas. And we're gonna do it, I'm gonna do mine in the, um, the landscape position. This is landscape, this will be portrait. So we'll do landscape. And you can see that the orange is not on the right side of your canvas at all. So the orange is gonna be over here to the left and more at the top than at the bottom. So I'm gonna take that burnt sienna and just using small strokes, block in that orange. And then we'll also do the cast shadow coming out here at the bottom. Also looks a little darker up in here, over here, and over here. Now that's the block in of the shape itself. But what I also want to do in this step is to block in the basic value. And all value means is how dark or how light your color is. So if you're looking at your reference photo, you can see that there's a highlight on the left side of your orange that's very light. And then the way the light is hitting it, it's very light on the top, and it tends to move into a more vibrant red before it goes to the dark side in shadow. So I'm gonna take my burnt sienna and paint in a dark shadow. It also has a nice, dark portion right here and right here. My background is dark. Notice how I'm holding my brush. It's like a baton, like I'm going to conduct an orchestra. So there's my darks, for, except maybe the uh, shadow side of that little part of the orange right there. There's a real good dark here. Now, the next thing I want to do is to pull out my lights. So I'm going to take a paper towel, wrap it around my finger, stick it in my washer water, and say, where is it light on my canvas? What we're trying to do is to get everything broken down into three values, dark, medium, and light. And we paint it in our darks, we're gonna pull out our lights, and what we don't touch will be that medium. So over here on the orange, it's pretty light. And then also, where that light is hitting here on the table, it's light. If you wait too long to pull out your lights, you won't, they won't come up. Acrylic paint is water soluble while it's wet, but once it dries, it's waterproof. It turns into a, a plastic like. Now I have heard, even though I haven't tried this myself, that if you take some um, hand sanitizer 
on a paper towel or a Q-tip or something, it will help bring some of that up. And that's only if it dries. If it's not completely dry yet, it should pull off pretty easily. And that's step number two. So at this point, we've done step number one, the underpainting. Step number two, the block in of the basic shapes and values. And then before we go to step number three, you want your underpainting to be fairly dry. If you've painted it really thin, it doesn't take very long at all to dry on its own. But because I painted that background a little thicker to get it dark, it's still a tiny bit wet, so you can use a blow dryer to um, dry that off, but you want to be really careful to keep that moving. You don't want to just hold it in one place. This can be flammable, so we don't want it to burst into flames. You just want to keep the, 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 the hot heat moving all across it. And then once that dries, we'll be ready to go into step number three. Step number three is the scrub in of the basic color. And whether I'm working with a landscape or a still life or even a portrait, I like to start as far back in space and come forward. And then that way, if I'm painting something in the front, I can go over my boundaries and whatever's behind it will look like it's truly behind it. It'll help add to that three-dimensional look. So we're gonna start with this dark color back here. And what I want to, um, Kind of give you a heads up on it's easy to go oh it's black so i'm going to paint black but black is a very cold color and i find that it's best to reserve black to the very end of your painting in case you need an accent somewhere and if you do need an accent then you've got that value where you can go that dark with a little black somewhere to add that little pop of color to add the magic to your painting we don't want to just start out putting black on the canvas so what color would we use? I think it would be best to use the complement to orange. And if you look at a color wheel, the complement to any color is the color that is directly across from that color on the color wheel. So the opposite or complement to orange is blue. Now you should have some ultramarine blue on your palette. But because I want to go a little darker and a little cooler, because all of that's in shadow, I'm going to mix my ultramarine blue with a little black. So it won't be solid black. It'll be blue with a little black in there. So we'll mix that up. So it's lighter than the black, but it's darker than the blue and you want to see where that's going and just lay it in in very loose strokes. I also like to leave a little bit of air between each stroke to let a little bit of that underpainting show through. I think that adds a lot to the painting. You can lay in a deliberate stroke like that, or you can do what we call the scrub in. And that's where you scrub it. Can you hear it scrubbing? And I may put a little bit of this in my cast shadow, but just a little bit. Because if you look at that shadow color, there's lots of color in there. I want the whole thing to be that dark. Now, while that is still wet, I want to put in another color. Because do you see how dark that shadow is up in the corners? 
But then when you come down, there's kind of a half shadow, which is called your penumbral shadow. And so we want to have a lighter shadow on the edges of our dark shadow. One's the umbra, the other one's the penumbral. So I'm gonna add a little red to this color and maybe just a little white. And when I say a little white, I mean just a little. We still want it kind of dark. You can always hold your brush up and see if it's about the right value. So we're just gonna throw in a little bit of that lighter shadow color. Now one thing I want you to do is to have those strokes going in different directions. We don't want to just have a straight line of a stroke. You want those to have more interest. And you can lap over the darker color some if you want. And then we've got the penumbral down here as well. I'm gonna go one step even lighter. So I'm gonna add a little more white. And the reason why I'm adding white is because it's lighter, but it's also a very cold color. So we're still in this shadow. But what happens when that shadow comes into the light? It's gonna be lighter and it's gonna be warmer. And of our three primary colors, yellow is the warmest and blue is the coolest. Black and white are cold and your red is more of a medium to, it's just a medium. Let's just throw it in as medium to not confuse things right now. And when you think of cold, what is a cold color? What is a warm color? It's really, uh, it depends on what you're putting it next to. If I was to say 98 degrees, is 98 degrees warm or is 98 degrees cool? Well, it depends on what its purpose is. If it's 98 degrees outside in the ambient temperature, that's pretty hot. But if I'm taking my temperature and my body temperature is 98, that's pretty normal. If I was trying to bake brownies in an oven and the oven's 98 degrees, it's too cold. So you can see how it's barely relevant um, or it, to see if it's going to be a hot color, a warm color, that sort of thing, it all varies but blue is your coolest. So if we're gonna go here into the light and warm it up, we're gonna have to add a color to it. It can't just be white because white is cold and we want a warm light. So I'm gonna grab a little white and a little yellow, not much, just a little. I might even get a little orange. So it's still very light. When you're mixing colors, sometimes it only takes the amount of paint that would fit on the head of a pen to change your puddle in the direction you want it to go. If you ever get too much paint in there where you can't get it to bend to the color you want, sometimes it's better just to start over. So we added it over here. Let's add it on this side. And again, I'm painting it pretty thin.
the more you paint, the more you're going to want to keep the area of focus is where we're going to build up our color and have it thicker. But in the other areas that are not your area of focus, we want to keep that really thin. So we're not going to build up that paint right there. We're just going to put a thin layer on there. Clean that brush really good. And then we'll scrub in the basic color on the orange. So while you're finishing up scrubbing in the basic colors in your background, I want to talk about some of the colors we're going to be looking at on the orange. Now when you think of the fruit, an orange, what color is it? Orange, obviously. What came first, the fruit or the name orange? Yeah, back in the 1500s there was no color called orange. That kind of came when the citrus fruit started coming into Europe, but anyway, I digress listen to a podcast so that's where orange came from orange is the the local color of, of that shape right there of that object right there but it can't be orange all the way around because we don't have equal ambient light all the way around we have a highlight on the left side that kind of takes out some of that color and that's why right here on this orange it looks white because the light is so intense, it's drowning out that color. But as the light goes around the sphere, it goes into the local color, which is orange. And then right before it turns into the shadow, you have your half tone, and that is your most chromatic color in your painting or on that object. And to be chromatic, that just means it's the most intense. It's the color that resides closest to the edge of the color wheel. Colors on the edge of the color wheel are chromatic and intense. And as the colors go toward the center, they become neutral. So that the center of the color wheel is kind of a, a brown color. Brown is a warm neutral, gray is a cool neutral. So that's where they meet in the center. So we don't wanna paint the whole thing orange because really we just have a small part that is orange. Now, typically I teach that we mix our color and we can easily mix orange by mixing red and yellow. The problem lies in what red and what yellow. And every artist I talk to tries to decide what the best colors are to come up with the mixes that works best for their paintings. If you have um, alizarin crimson as your red. It has a lot of blue in it and if you try to mix alizarin crimson and yellow together, what happens when you mix yellow with red and blue? You get brown. It's not going to be orange. The same way with, um, with the yellow. It depends on which yellow that you get, how that's going to mix. So I always like to have a convenient orange on hand for those occasions when I really need a brilliant, intense, chromatic orange. So I'm going to start with that orange. And we don't typically paint what I call neat, straight from the bottle or straight from the tube. And when I put it straight from the tube on my brush and hold it up, I can see that that orange is much lighter and warmer than the orange straight from the tube. It's more of a yellow. So I'm going to mix a little yellow and a little orange together. And maybe just a dot, a pin dot of white. And we are pretty close. So that color is on the upper left side of your orange. Maybe a little more orange in there, just a little bit. That orange and yellow together makes a nice crack.
and I'm standing to the side so it may look a little wonky. Here, I'll get right here in the front, okay. And then next we're gonna go to that half tone, which is really closer to red. Now I'm probably gonna mix it in with that first color just to get some color harmony going here. It's actually a little darker than that. And that's gonna go here, almost diagonally across. And I'm also seeing a little bit of that color down in here where some lights popping back up and giving some reflected light. And I'm going to clean my brush really good and get it dry. And then kind of soften that edge in between the two. Might even use a paper towel. Now that's nice and soft. We can also use that color if we wanted to for a little detail. Do you see how there's some ridges going up toward the, the top there? We can put a little bit of that color in there now just because it's already on our brush. Again, I'm going to soften it with my finger just not just a straight line and we can always go back and put that in in a different step that is called for details but now we've got to put the shadow side in so I'm going to use that same color and I'm going to add a little burnt sienna to it if I get too much burnt sienna I may have to adjust it and I think I did get too much so I'm going to add some orange to that burnt sienna got to go darker. It's got to go darker and cooler, so I'm going to put some blue in. Nope, too blue. I'm going to start over. It doesn't take much to bend those colors. So I'm going to start over with some orange and a little burnt sienna and the tiniest, tiniest bit of blue. Nope, I need to go darker. And then we've got a really dark spot right here. light bounce up down here so I'm going to throw some light in maybe touch it a little bit just to soften that edge and then work a little bit of that white in here where the highlight is and again paper towel or your finger even a dry brush When you add all those different values 
of orange. It takes a two-dimensional shape and turns it into a three-dimensional object. So now it looks like it's spherical instead of just a flat circle. What we haven't done yet is scrubbed in our basic color on the, um, the cast shadow. There is a little bit of a, an occlusion shadow, and the occlusion shadow is this tiny little line where the orange is actually touching the table. And that is typically your darkest dark on your painting. It's where the object is resting on another object. It's a really dark line and it will ground your object to the table or the surface that it's sitting on. If you don't put in that occlusion shadow, then your object is gonna look like it's hovering above the table. So this is where you could use a really dark brown or even go ahead and use that black just straight out of the tube. I'm using a flat brush, which is about a half an inch this way, but if you go that way, it's pencil thin. So I can just round off down here at the bottom where it's sitting on the table. Like that. Let's do one more scrub in and then we will have completed step number three. So we want to put in our cast shadow but do you see how orange that shadow is up next to the orange? It gets darker and bluer as it goes out. But up here next to the orange, it's much, much warmer. So again, I'm going to use probably the same color we had in here. And just scrub that in. Might even make it a little more chromatic up near the um, up near the orange because it just seems like there's some bouncing light around that catches it, especially on this side. So I had a really good question um, from one of the students, and, it's, and the question was, do I paint the whole object orange to begin with, and then start building the color on that? And as the artist, you get to decide how you paint your own paintings. But if you're asking me what I would recommend, and that is to not paint it, because we don't want our focal point to be in the shadow over here, so we don't want to build up our paint in that area. Remember, we're going to keep it thin in the background areas and only build up in the area where we want to have a focal point. So what we want to do is that top and left side of the orange is more of a yellowish orange. Then it goes into more of a red orange, and then it goes more into a neutral or brown orange. Now, one thing you might want to notice is that light is so intense, not only does it drown out the color in the highlight of the orange, to where the, the, the hottest part of the orange here in the light is actually more of a white, and of course I added yellow to it to warm it up, so it's not a pure white, it's, it's white with yellow in it. But that light is also hitting the um, table plane and bouncing up and adding highlight, a little highlight right here on the orange, and even um, adding a little warmth underneath the orange. You have to have light in order to have color. And so if you had an orange in equal ambient light, it would be orange all the way around. But because this is a dark room with an orange on a white table and the light coming from one direction, you don't have equal ambient light. You have your hottest light here. And then as that orange moves around that sphere, it can't have the light follow it. So you've got a hot light and then you've got a medium light and then this side is the shadow side of your orange. 
This is the cast shadow from your orange. And then this is the occlusion shadow where it touches the table. And really all three of those values and all three of those shadows helps make a two-dimensional shape look like a three-dimensional form. So it looks like we have finished step number three. What was step number one? Anybody? The underpainting, very good. Step number two? It's the blocking of the basic shape and value. Very good. Step number three? You scrub in <laughs> your basic colors. And now we're ready to go to step number four. And step number four is my favorite step in the whole process. I call this the magic stage. This is where we take our painting from a pretty picture to a masterpiece. And we do that by reaching into our little imaginary toolkit that is beside every artist and we pull out every tool to make this painting pop. Now what are those things? One is to add some detail. So what detail do you think we might add? The little stem in the navel up here, we need, to, we need to add some detail there. It looks like it might be a very pale green and brown, but it's got a cast shadow side to it. So that's a detail we're gonna add. I might wanna go in and lighten up this little highlight that's popping up from that reflection right there, if I wanted to. I could reshape my shapes. In fact, while I go, I backed up and looked at my painting from at least 10 feet, and I noticed it had got a little wonky. And that happens when you're painting to the side. But if you're looking at it straight on, you know you can clean that up by painting into the negative shape. So you can reshape that shape. You can sharpen some edges. You can soften some edges you can move color around. For example, we've got orange here, but we don't have orange anywhere else. If I wanted to, I could take a little orange, mix it with that blue, but keep it on the orange side and keep it kind of dark, and pop some orange in some other places on my canvas usually in the shadows would we do something like that. It just makes for a more interesting painting when you can move your color around. It also makes it more interesting if you can have your lightest light and your darkest dark next to each other. So this would make a really cool, not an accent, but a, a highlight right down here. Because the highlight next to your accent, that occlusion shadow, that's your darkest dark. And I don't really want that to be my lightest light, but it could be a light. And that's going to add some drama to your painting. Do you know what the definition of drama is? It's where you have opposites meeting each other at an edge. I like to use the uh, example of Downton Abbey, because I love Downton Abbey. And it's a family that's the richest family in the county until Lord Grantham loses all the family wealth. So what are we gonna do? There's some drama right there. We're the wealthiest now, we're the poorest. Drama. Oh, but Matthew just inherited Lavinia's money. We're wealthy again. So we're going from the wealthiest to the poorest to the wealthiest. Where those edges meet is where we have drama. So that's what we're doing here. We're going to have lights against darks, soft edges and sharp edges. Anywhere you have opposites, complementary colors, the orange and the blue, you're going to have drama. So let's throw in a few details and don't spend a lot of time on this or a lot of energy. We don't want to overwork our painting. We're just gonna mix up a little green. And I'm gonna mix some green up using black and yellow instead of blue and yellow. And maybe just a little white because it's a really pale green. So 
just a little green on one side, just a little brown, very light brown, and very warm brown. So I'll use a little bit of burnt sienna with some um, yellow in it to top the top of that little stem. And then I'm also going to use that reddish color that we used here to cast a shadow of that stem. And if that's not dark enough, then I can add a little blue to it to get it a little darker. dark on the right side of the stem and it's dark in that cast shadow. And when I work on this and get it to the point that I think it's finished, I want to put my brush down. Because the worst thing you can do is overwork your painting. It's better to stop too soon with lacking a stroke than doing one stroke too many. And typically at this point, I will stand up and back up and look at the painting from at least 10 feet. And I might go take a walk, fix dinner, do anything else to get fresh eyes. Because when you've been staring into your painting for so long, you really can't see it anymore. Have you ever tried to proof a term paper right when you finished your term paper? You don't see any typos, you don't see any wrong words, it looks perfect until you drive to school the next morning and then every typo pops up. That's because you have fresh eyes. So you want to have fresh eyes to come back to your painting and make a decision, is it ready for step number five? So we have to decide, do I need to add anything? Do I need to sharpen anything? Do I need to soften anything? Do I need to move any color around? Do I need to reshape the shape? What do I need to do to take that from a pretty picture to a masterpiece? And very often that, that answer is nothing. It's ready to go. So we move into step number five. Does anybody know what step that is? What we do in step number five? Sign your name. That is the only thing we have left to do. Now I use a special brush for that. You want to use the smallest round brush you have. And what I don't want you to do is to get all wise on me and use a paint pen. We really want to use a brush. And you decide what color you want to sign in. You take your small round brush and you grab the color of paint. You add a lot of water and you twist that brush until you get a nice sharp point on your on the bristles. I might use my arm as a mall stick and then rest my hand on there and then in mostly down strokes you want to sign your name. And that's it. Thanks for joining me today. And we're going to take this a step further next week. So if you want to practice, that's the best way to get good at this. It's always best to practice every day, but if you can't practice every day, the more practice you can do, the better. And we'll see you in the next video.